I'm going to be. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, really, about how I came to do the show, but also maybe why I was asked to do it, and the main themes. I'm not going to talk you through or do a tour of the show. It's really basically uh, a very basic sort of introduction. Uh, uh, my work, as you may know, is often interested in comparative elements or putting two things together that might not seem uh, correct or, or uh, in, in any way uh, normal uh, in that sense. And this is one piece of work I did, which was trying to connect really the 19th and 20th centuries through music, through making a brass band play acid house music, which is 20th, late 20th century electronic dance music. So it's trying to connect the Industrial Revolution to a a digital culture, and maybe this is what this exhibition is also trying to do. It's trying to bring two big ideas together and trying to make sense of them and see where, what they do actually have in common, which I believe is actually quite a lot. Again, another unusual image of two things coming together. This is a, a photograph taken in 1973 of a, a wrestler going back to see his father. It's almost a biblical story, going back to see his father at the coal mine he used to work in as a teenager to show his father and show the other miners what he'd made of his life. And in a way for me, a little bit like this show, it's about a tension between two centuries really, between the Britain in, as an industrial nation, but also what was, what was happening to Britain in the 70s, becoming a becoming the post-industrial nation we know it to be now, but also becoming a, a nation based around entertainment, based around services and so on. And yet this man, Adrian Street, the wrestler, was doing this with his own life, with his own body, literally becoming this, this person, showing the future, really, to these miners. In some respects, it's less of an image related to Morris, but it's, it's more like something that William Blake would have understood if you think about Jerusalem and, and the wording of Jerusalem about this figure coming from the future in a, almost in a, sort of in a chariot to show what Britain could be or England could be or could become. So this, uh, these are concerns I've had for some years and um, I, have to t I have to tell you that I didn't come up with the idea of the show. It was Sally, who is the head of programs here, came up with the idea of the show because she knew that I was interested in Morris, or I've been interested in Morris for some years. Um, if any of you went to Venice or saw the show that toured subsequently, toured Britain, uh, subsequently of, of the Venice show, you'd have known there was an image of Morris in the, uh, in the exhibition. This is a mural, a huge mural of William Morris destroying Roman Abramovich's yacht, throwing it into the lagoon. And it was something I was very interested in Morris as, a, as the crusader, but also as this rather, uh, vengeful political figure and it's something I was I was interested in, in exploring not just Morris the designer and so that's why in this exhibition you'll see you know there's a whole section dedicated to this this aspect of his career but um, thinking of when I was asked to do this show I was trying it occurred to, for me personally it seemed like a very natural show and the first thing I thought was why didn't I think of this so I was slightly angry with myself with that, but also it occurred to me very quickly why they could relate to each other. So that first drawing you saw, that mind map drawing, that could be, uh, I could do that for this show, but I won't. Uh, but I realized very quickly they had a lot in common. They were both artists who were printmakers or known for printmaking, for reproduction. They both wrote a lot. They have big publishing careers, they're very interested in publishing, and publishing is an element of the show I was very interested in because you really get to hear their voice, literally, or almost hear their voice. You know, Warhol was, tr was dictating a lot of his books, so you do get that idea of what he was like to speak to or be around. But it's in those books where you actually hear what they really felt about the world, and it's quite interesting that w Warhol was actually quite anti the rich or anti the taste of the rich, as, as Morris was. So that was, for me, was a very interesting thing. So they have these huge, sprawling careers. They're both artists that are not content with one medium. And Morris really had a multimedia career before the, the phrase was, was coined. And of course, we, as we know, Warhol is really the archetypal 20th century, 21st century artist, in the sense that an artist who was 
looking at every part of the media and trying to work out how he could make a TV show, films, produce records, print magazines, write books and so on. He, they, they both left, for me, no stone unturned. And of course, as we know with Morris, he was, just, he was a songwriter, he wrote recipes, he wrote political books, he translated poetry, and that's just his written word. I think someone's written, so, said somewhere that he's one of the most, I think he wrote more than most Victorian novelists. His output is huge. So I was interested in these, these careers, these big sprawling careers, printmaking, but also I was interested in the fact that they're both imperial artists. Both of them are working during their respective countries' empires almost at the height of their empires, you could argue, especially Warhol. You know, he documented the post-war American empire, effectively. And Morris was very concerned with the British empire and, and its effect on people around the world, not just in Britain, especially India. So they're, they have their imperial artists, but also had their, they had their own empires as well, their own business empires. And so that was something that I wanted to examine. And of course, working methods was something that was very interesting for me because of how they organized their production and how they were interested in production um, was really their view of how the world should be in my opinion they both thought the way the work was made was integral to the work itself and the fact that for Warhol he envisioned this kind of world of work where people relaxed and played and worked at the same time, which is in a way it's very similar to when you think about these tech companies now and big advertising agencies. They've all based their working environment on the factory. So I was always interested in, in contrasts of images, like with that brass band's acid house and, the, and the, the miner with his father. I'm interested in these sort of rather strange or shocking contrasts. So that's why in the exhibition there's a whole series of pictures of, of Warhol at work Warhol with his family, effectively, and his collaborators. And then the uh, rather more sedate working environment for, for William Morris. And then his collaborators, his family. Um, very Victorian image there, obviously. Um, this idea of reproduction as well is something that, uh, in the last room especially, was, was of great interest to me, because I think they both have, their careers are actually quite promiscuous. They're, they're very promiscuous artists. They're both interested in reproduction, in the sort of fertility. That room, that last room, is meant to be a very fertile room, almost overwhelmingly so. And um, when you think of Morris's output, it was a huge, just for the wallpapers and the, and the fabrics, was a huge output. So just in that sense, it's very fecund, but also in the imagery as well. And when we think about the different colorways, different sizes of, of work, the different ways of printing them on different fabrics and so on, there was just this, this desire to keep reproducing and get something out into the world, which is what printmaking is all about, and publishing especially. In a way, publishing is the mass market version of printmaking. Um, and of course, with Warhol too, he sort of set the standard for most artists, well, for a lot of artists, about how to make money and how to... Uh, keep marketing and remarketing your work, which is what he did throughout to the end of his life, really. Um, so that was something I thought had to be looked at. Um, these are two flower works, which are not from the original exhibition, but were taken later when he did sort of negative images and then different colors and so on. The flower works actually are very important. We didn't get a big one for the show, one of the original ones, but if, if people that know about them, they're made in different sizes from ones that are about 12 foot square to ones that are literally about three inches. So all sizes, all different colors, all different colorways and so on. And that was his first real experiment in that, I, I, you could argue really, which is very apt when you think of it, it is flowers. And so with the show, I was very interested, if not, the, almost a requirement for the show was to use wallpapers, and Morris wallpapers especially. Um, Using Warhol wallpapers is a little bit more difficult because it costs so much to get the licensing. But Morris, kindly, we got free paper from Sanderson. And just to have these contrasts, these rather shocking contrasts, which I think was, for me, was a very important thing to have. Um, with the, the camouflage, obviously, because if you see the, the match piece there on the table, which is all the stages to make the acanthus wallpaper, about a third of the way in or a quarter of the way into this sort of stages of, of the manufacture you see that actually looks like camouflage. 
So that was a happy coincidence for, for us. Also, there is a small part of the show about politics. Obviously, this, isn't, I mean, this is not a, a kind of show that should be seen in Oxford, at modern art Oxford. This is the, really, this, is the, this show is the kind of show you'd see at the V&A or, or the Met or somewhere like that. But it, it, it's really to modern art Oxford's sort of credit that they took on a, an exhibition like this because it really is a sort of museum style show. And I don't know if you're aware, but it's, it's, it's the most uh, popular show they've, they've ever had. And today, you know, as you can hear, it's slightly irritating hearing people upstairs, but actually that's a sign of a popular art, art exhibition, and we should be happy about that. Wow, what's happened to my voice? <laughs> what was that? There's mu I can hear music up here. Can you hear music? Can you hear music? Yes. Is, that, is that upstairs or is that down here? Are you giving me a bit of a compliment to my... Uh, <laughs> am I boring you? Oh, it's a way to get me off, off the stage, probably. Anyway, so look, I'm near, near the end. But uh, the music is quite odd to hear that, I have to say. But what I was, in, I was, was interested in, in placing Warhol as a political artist, because I believe he's a very political artist. And um, so, so to have that image on the wallpaper meant to me, a lot to me, as you can see upstairs, these very tough images on very decorative wallpaper. And for me, the whole idea about having that is really about the, the politics, of the, as the aesthetics, really, of Morris is that he was making works of extreme beauty in a very ugly time. If you lived in London, the middle of London, in the sort of late 19th century, you'd have been sort of caked in pollution just walking out of the, your door, or any British city, probably worse in the north, in, 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 in big industrial cities. And so he was making these works of extreme beauty, almost as a weapon, I'd argue, in the, in the face of the Industrial Revolution. So in a way, that takes us back to the image of Adrian Street and his father. Um, that's my little introduction. It's a sort of wander around the show, and I can take two questions, I've been told by Ben. Uh -huh. Does anyone have a question? I can't believe it. There's got to be one question. Yeah, there's a question here. Did you come to, um, in your career, curating it, how did you come to select, pick the contrast that you want? I'll, I'll repeat the question. How did I come to curate the contrast? I was looking for. Well, I mean, a lot of it is practical. With Warhol, you're very limited about what, with what you can get. The value of the work is such that we tried to uh, get loans from a private collection, and we couldn't get them. We tried for some months. So there's works that we really wanted that we couldn't get. So you just have to, in a way, I know this sounds really, this is a very pedestrian answer in a way, you get what you can, what you can find, and um, you make the most of that and you try and make a show that looks like that is, a, that is exactly the work I wanted, even though there was another one that you may have wanted. <laughs> so ha having said that, the, the William Morris world were overwhelmingly generous. Uh, I did that because I did the show in Venice, which went to the William Morris Gallery, they basically opened their doors to me in the sense of loaning more or less whatever I wanted, including the tapestry from Birmingham. So that was easier. But having, uh, again, with the Warhol, um, Anthony Doffe was very helpful. And it was through Anthony Doffe in 86 that when he had a show at his gallery that I met Warhol quite, you know, very briefly, really. But it's a very important part for me as a young person to meet Andy Warhol, as you can imagine. And um, Doffe was instrumental in getting us loans from the Tate that had previously been part of his collection, and now it's called Artist Rooms. So he was doing little deals and getting us things um, and uh, was, was very supportive. So you just, you bring in favours. And I think one reason artists are asked to curate shows is that they can, they get access that, that maybe a curator might not get, and there's a sort of a, uh, there's a curiosity about an artist coming to a museum or gallery to, to ask for things for an exhibition. Rod, oh, there's one there. Mm. But I'm just wondering... I knew there'd be a but. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just wondering if it's so, if politically, if it's so convincing. You know, there's that sense in Morris that, I think as you said, a text panel somewhere, um, and, and, and in any case, I'm sure everyone here knows, that he really was you know, politically committed, and his output was, 
not much of it was to that end, really. Mm. And as a consequence, his works were economically accessible. He had a shop. Yeah. He sold stuff. Um, in Warhol, you really get the sense that there's a sort of performance of industry. But actually, his work is not economically accessible. It's not actually... Um, it's not actually uh, for anyone other than collectors, really. So... Oh, right. Okay, good. You're going to contradict me. I, so, I will, so yes. I'm just wondering, so I'm just wondering, really... So, uh, on the face of it, visually, there seems to be this very striking uh, resonance between them that you've convincingly created. But I just wonder if that's really underpinned by the kind of political aspirations okay. of both of them. I can answer in a number of ways, hopefully convincingly. I think we view Warhol now through the lens of the art market now, which, you know, he's the most expensive artist in the world, more or less. It would cost you more to buy a Warhol than it would to buy a Titian or a, a Raphael, literally. So it's kind of crazy. And it, and it makes no sense of the market either, because the supply is actually quite high, and yet the prices are even higher than for an artist who would be very little supply, of, like an old master painter. So I think we, we've been a bit skewed by that. But also Warhol made ton, loads and loads of editions. He would sign anything that was made. He made books. He, made, you know, he worked with records. He did lots of, you know, his work, you know, he had a magazine. He, he disseminated his work in very democratic ways, you could argue, through publishing, through recording, through films, through television. Um, by signing anything that people put in front of him, dollar bills, Campbell's soup cans, anything. So I think he made huge additions as well, very big additions, which weren't actually that expensive. And he was always wanting to experiment in that, from what I know, when you hear about him. But, um, of course, we remember the, the masterpiece, large works on the whole. But I think actually of all the artists of that era, and even compared to this era, he was someone who was wanting to disseminate and make things that were cheap and people could have in their homes. He loved the idea of people having his posters in their houses and so on, which is, which is now actually is crazy when you think about Warhol. You cannot see much Warhol in the, online because he's so copyright protected. You can't see the work, which is bizarre because he virtually invented the internet without realizing it. And yet, he would want his work to be seen everywhere by everybody at any time. Uh, but it's, it's very, very heavily controlled. So when you do a show like this, you've got to pay for every image you use for the press, every image in a catalogue, which totally goes against his idea of copyright as well, because he just stole whatever he could. Um, but I think, so yes, as a conclusion, Rod, I think we, unfortunately, we see Warhol through our own greedy kind of society we have now. He wasn't like Morris, and you know, no one was like Morris, but I think in a way he was much more of a Democrat than most artists at the time. It's yeah. it very similar to Morris. I mean, there's this show, show and this money uh, thing that's uh, nothing to do with art. These are the forces uh, which are beyond the art and artists. And just to say it's a beautiful show, and it's, Thank you. you can see that uh, it's done by, curated by an artist. And it's an extension of your, your practice, actually. Well, thank you. And um, I don't think it's a museum-type show. I wouldn't agree with you. OK. It's, a, it's an exhibition which is very pertinent to the times we live in. And this is a great place for this show. Well, that's very kind. Well thank you. Anyway, oh, I, we, have, we have time for another question. Are we, how are we doing? One more. One more, OK. The lady at the back? I can talk to you later. Would you consider Andy Warhol a romantic artist? I would consider him a romantic artist. When you look at his images of women, and you look at his images of women that he was collecting as a child, you realize there's actually there's very little between those two images. There's no cynicism or irony in those female Hollywood star portraits. And then you look at all the drawings he made of young men and of flowers. He's a, he's a total romantic and a dreamer, really. But amongst other things, he's many things, obviously. But yes, I would. I'll do that later, Emma. Okay, I think that's me. that's it for me. Who's next? Thank you. All right.